Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. Welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shawnee Wan, and joining me, as always, the warden of Nassau County, the supreme leader of all spoilers, and an expert on today's topic, it's John. John, how psyched are you to finally get to devote time to this particular character? Time, the whole entire episode is going to be really bad. You've been I, dreading it, oh, haven't man, you? Dude, I get killed so many times for all from all of the Sansa lovers out there, and a lot of them. Uh, what I've noticed, at least the obvious thing, get it with me. I mean, I, I get killed by these people. I get killed like they cannot divide fictional character from reality. Okay, I think I know what you mean. Can you be a little more specific? Just take things with her so serious. Like, you bear Sansa, it's like, oh, you hate female characters in books. You hate females. You're anti-women. I'm telling you, I've seen it all. It's just ridiculous. All right. You know what? If we're going to do this, let's do it right. Oh, no. Let's just lean into the punch. With Sansa Stark in particular, I think I'm picking up what you're putting down. Sansa Stark, more so than Daenerys, yeah, more so yes. than Arya, any other character. I guess it would have to be more about gender than it would have to be about race in Westeros. Yeah. But Sansa is, she's like that lightning rod character for, I don't want to say political correctness, but she is the representation. I personally have never got into any kind of going back and forth. Like, if I say the bad thing about Daenerys, it never comes into like, oh, you don't like, you know, like, oh, you have a problem with female characters. Never get it. I see something bad right. about Sansa. Also, it turns into this whole entire, you know, girl power. You're a best kiss. Yes, you're- yes I, I got called that once. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, everybody's entitled to their opinion, but why is it Sansa? I don't, you know, you know what? I'm going to say it right now so we all know what's going to be the biggest painful thing out of this. I know she's going to live through that out this. Scale of one to ten. Nine, nine and a half. Okay. There is a half percent uh, point. I'll call, I'll call it a nine. Don't get, I won't go to the halves. I'll, I'll call it a nine out of ten. She, she's going to live. There's, there's one point of the deal that she'll die, but she's going to live. And out of that nine out of ten, it's probably 50 50 that she's going to be some sort of like ruler queen of something at the end, which is really going to. At this point, I'm fully believing that that's going to happen. I am 100% in agreement with you to Sansa Stark's fate. She is not going to die, and she is going to rule at least the North when it's all said and done. I don't think she's going to rule all of Westeros, but of all the characters remaining, she's definitely in the top five of characters most likely to rule the realm. We're going to address where this anger at Sansa comes from, but I'm going to ask right off the bat, does some of it have to do with the Sansa fandom, the Jonsa shippers? These fans of Sansa who want to see Sansa and John married and together. I still think there's a possibility that I think more than I, if she goes with anyone, it's me, Gendry, I think at this point. And maybe I'm skipping way, way ahead. I've said it a couple times. Where does the Stark name go to after this? Like, how does it live on? The only way I can, can see it live on if somehow that there's like, like a John Sansa child and they call that the Stark kid. Well, okay, but. Knowing John, that would have to mean that he never finds out who he is, right? No, he's going to find out. And I, at this point, I really don't think it needs – it's less and less that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. I thought more so like a couple of years ago, I thought that had, at least there was a little more of a distinct possibility of it happening. Of John, him being a Stark at the end. You know, him being, you know, with, like doing something with, something with Sansa. I was actually thinking maybe two wives – one with Daenerys and then one with Sansa, so you have like the fire and ice. Yeah, but you, well, well, you know Sansa wouldn't stand for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I don't, I don't, I don't see the John Sansa marriage at the end, but it is a very popular theory. I don't think it's a question of does she live, does she die, will she be a queen 
supporting a king that rules the realm? Or will she have her own regency, so to speak? Will she be a protector of an area or the protector of the realm in all at the end of this series? I don't think those are the big questions concerning Sansa. I think the biggest question concerning Sansa is how does the position of leadership, the position of power that she will have pretty much undoubtedly at the end of this series, how will that relate to the legacy, the lineage of House Stark moving forward? And I can't come up with an answer. I can't envision a way unless she's, honestly, unless she's marrying Bran, that that's the case. And she's not going to marry Bran. It's, you know, it's silly to think that. Unless there's a secret Stark we don't know about. (laughs) Another baby swap. Yeah. Triple baby swap. Maybe Benjen has an illegitimate bastard child. We will find out, and we'll find out pretty soon. In the meantime, we're going to talk about Sansa. John, is she the worst? Is she worse than Catelyn? Mm. No. She's not. not, not no. <laughs> not so bad as that. No. Yeah, Catelyn's as bad as it gets. You know what I was thinking about today? There's something with Sansa. You first get introduced to these characters. You know, there's certain characters you don't really know what to expect for them. You don't know if you should like them or not like them. I know there are certain other characters that, you know, right away you have an opinion of. Like, you know, Jimmy Lannister right away. Oh, God. This guy threw a little kid out the window. Put away a third bag. Especially Lannister, you kind of knew right away that, you know, it's like she's definitely that so you're going to enjoy or like. Eddard Stark's a character you know, right away. You're going to be like, all right, this guy Eddard, this is the guy right here, you know? Mm-hmm. There's just something about Sansa that right away that I just knew that I'm not going to like this character. The way, the way she was, like, snotty. Are you looking at this from the book perspective? Or, well, I guess both. both I mean, she's, yeah. she's pretty accurate in her adaptation. Yeah, I don't think that there was something about her that I did not like at first. No, dude, I caught it right away. Caught it. Dude, caught it. Was it the comparison with Arya? Was it the way she treated Arya or the differences between the two characters? I think, you know, definitely the way they showed Sansa right away. And, like, Arya right off the bat was already shown as... This is going to be the more uh, likable character. Like, right away, Sansa was just not a likable character. It just was not going to happen. And that's what makes me even worse, feel even worse about her actually living and being in charge of some capacities because she was written like this. She was written not to be liked. Even Sansa fans have to acknowledge that she was not a likable character, especially early on. She was not a likable character. When you say not likable... Oh, Joffrey, I want to do everything for my Joffrey. Right, oh, okay. She's lying, you know, instead of being honest. Well, she's, I mean, she's, I think she's lying to herself more so. You, we've talked about this plenty of times before about young Sansa and her admiration, her crush on Prince Joffrey Baratheon. It's an understandable thing with young girls, a young boys too, when you have your first crush. Not really knowing who that person is, you're just a kid and you get your hormones. She's excited at the prospect of being queen. Joffrey's of similar age. What other kind of boys is she meeting at Winterfell in the north? And he's the crown prince. For me, I can go a ways to forgive some of her behavior early on. And I think the problem I have with Sansa, I think starts with the decisions she makes when things get very serious. When she starts making decisions that are very serious and affect everybody in her family and the realm as a whole, based on this crush. That's when I start to have problems with her. But early on, for me, I think it was more that her character was uninteresting, whereas Arya's was very interesting from the get-go. But at the same time, you needed that Sansa-type character. You had Catelyn showing us what a noble woman of Westeros is. But that perspective of Sansa, the young noble woman who's not married, who is coming into her own, it's an important voice in establishing this universe. I think for me, it's it's more that she's kind of boring, the things that she did. And then when she gets interesting, it's for all the wrong reasons. In season one, we meet Sansa. Her first scene is the stitching, right? With Septa Mordain and Arya. Has King Robert arrived by then? I'm trying to remember. And No, I think... I- I think that's uh, four. That doesn't matter either way. I just can't picture it straight in my mind. When King Robert arrives, one of the first things he does after seeing Lyanna's crypt is suggest... A marriage pact. I think suggest he says, yeah, this is what's going to happen. You have a daughter, I got a son. We'll join houses. Yeah, Robert's looking at this as 
he was going to marry Liana, and that was taken away from him. This is the next best thing because Ned has always been more of a brother to him than than his own brothers. So this is an exciting thing for him. It's an exciting prospect to carry on that friendship that he had with Ned and really make them a family through marriage. But Ned is not as excited mm-hmm. at the idea as Robert. Because Ned just hates King's Landing. He just, just hates King's Landing, I think. He knows damn well that the Lannisters are, you know, Robert's the king, yeah, but it's so filled with <laughs> Lannister, it's the word I'm looking for, Lannister slawing, Lannister maneuvering and political maneuvers. He compares him to a snake pit. Yeah. Robert being in, in a snake pit and not even realizing it, but it's also, as we find out, more than just the Lannisters. It's also Robert's behavior at the end of Robert's Rebellion and the decisions, not the decisions that Robert made, but the things that Robert was okay with, the things that Robert accepted, the way that Ned saw behavior of the Mad King, of Ares Targaryen, in Robert. And also the little things, too. The way Robert just controlled the expenses, I mean. Right, just the way he was living his life. Just ridiculous, like how he was mm-hmm. just spending so much money on stupid things. And, I, and that was also, you know, the people around Robert that probably took advantage, little finger, varies. Mm-hmm. They knew they can swindle some money out of him, make it look like it's, oh yeah, this money is for tournaments, but meanwhile, we're going to keep some money or something. The vices that you have, if you leave them unchecked, they control your life. To anybody with half a brain, it is physically obvious that Robert is a man that loves his wine. The way he behaves in the TV show, it's obvious that he is drinking way too much to the point where it's greatly affecting his health. For a guy like Littlefinger, for a guy like Varys, it's an obvious mark on the man. That's his weakness, and that's what's really controlling this guy's life. So you just let that ride, and you can pretty much do whatever you want. This marriage pact is suggested by King Robert. I'm not sure how Sansa finds out because I don't see Ned being the type to say something like, hey, Sansa, Robert suggested you marry the prince. He'll tell that to Catelyn, obviously. Catelyn told her. You think that's a a wise decision for Catelyn to get Sansa all all worked up about this? Stop yourself right there. You just used the word Catelyn and wise in the same Mm -hmm. sentence. About two words apart. So let's. <laughs> what, what wise things has Catelyn totally ever done? Yeah, we've gone through that. Nothing. Nothing that could be considered wise by anybody except for Catelyn. Sansa is a young girl and she's desperate to see the realm. She's desperate to get out of the north to leave Winterfell. And she's super excited at the idea of being the queen. She begs Catelyn, and I think it's the scene when Catelyn's doing her hair. It's all I ever wanted. Yeah, it's all I ever wanted. She begs Catelyn to make Ned agree to the engagement. But that's really the last of any discussion about it. Any reservations that Ned has, at least about the marriage pact, we don't really see that on screen. It's a done deal. Sansa and Arya, their storyline is super intertwined for season one. When the decision is made for Ned to become the Hand and to move part of the Stark household south to King's Landing with him, Obviously, he's going to bring Sansa. The idea is she'll be queen one day. She can't remain up in the north, especially if Ned's going south. She has to go and be at court. It's just the daughters that Ned brings with him. Right. It was, and it was going to be Bran, but Bran didn't, didn't go for a toss. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you got to leave Rob. No question. You have to oh, leave yeah, Rob. Definitely. You have to, yeah. You, you had to leave his... God forbid Edward had a heart attack on his way down. <laughs> Boy, yeah. he got stuck and went to fell. God forbid the whole thing's a setup. You can understand Ned's reasoning for bringing Bran. I guess you can understand his reasoning for leaving Rickon, the Stark at Winterfell. It's a stronger position if he has an heir at Winterfell. Even though Bran would be Rob's heir, technically, having Rickon there, he does have an heir at Winterfell. We triple up our heirs at the Stark household. Yeah. (laughs) It's amazing how strong in terms of lineage the Starks hold on the North is at the beginning of Game of Thrones to the point where now we're talking about there isn't even a Stark to rule. Just think of that. But with Bran's accident, it's just Sansa and Arya that end up traveling south to establish Ned's household as Hand to the King in King's Landing. During the journey, we have the incident of Joffrey and Nymeria and Joffrey being injured by Nymeria. 
with the butcher's boy. What was the butcher's boy's name? Ah, oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. It wasn't Jesus Christ. <laughs> no, it definitely wasn't. Oh, God. It, 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 it's going to be one, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's going to be one of those names. Yeah. Like, we're going to be like, oh, that was the name. Damn it. <laughs> mm-hmm. But the differences between Arya and Sansa, you know, Arya is a, what we used to call a tomboy. I don't think that's a politically correct term anymore, but Arya is a rough and tumble young girl. She wants to learn to fight with a sword. Specifically, she's excited about the sword that she got from John as a gift when she left. She's with the butcher's boy because she thinks it's interesting hanging out with a commoner her age who will do whatever she says and fight with her with swords. That's what they're doing when Joffrey and Sansa go for a romantic walk by the river. It's a real telling scene, right? Because you see Joffrey's true colors for the first time. And this is also really the first time we really see Sansa betraying her family. Yeah, you can make that argument, absolutely, that she chooses Joffrey, who's obviously acting like a whiny, entitled, immature little boy in this scene. Because the total skin is if Sansa tells the truth. But she doesn't, well, I mean, she does lie. She lies saying she doesn't remember. But she doesn't lie outright and say Arya and the boy attacked Joffrey. She doesn't quite agree with Joffrey's version of the story. But what really happened, she doesn't She doesn't confirm that either. I do give this a pass. You do not. But what are the repercussions? What would they have been if she was honest in this scene? And she said, yeah, Joffrey's an asshole. Joffrey just attacked this kid. And then Nymeria went after him because Nymeria thought Arya was in danger. It doesn't matter if that's the reality of what happened, and it is the reality of what happened, Joffrey's still the crown prince, and he can basically do whatever he wants. I say it's a tough spot for Sansa, but it is telling of her future behaviors that have more dire consequences. Cersei decides one of the direwolves has to be killed. Nymeria is not around. Oh, but there's another one. Well, now Sansa, now thank you, you know? Now you get what you deserve. You don't want to be honest, now your wolf dies. And you think that would have been less enough to her, right? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> you, you think like, all right, now I see why my father keeps on warning me and or is going, he does warn her and warn them about the Lannisters. Nope, I still want to marry Joffrey. She doesn't even make the connection between what they just did. Yeah. How, how they turned that up, like, uh, you know, how they just made that turn, uh, that flip of the coin. So the next big part of Sansa's story in season one is the tourney at King's Landing. And here she meets her future ally, I guess. Her future supporter, Peter Baelish, Littlefinger. He is a little bit disgusting in this scene. He's always disgusted. He just. <laughs> yeah. Especially in the show. Sansa, I want to take you to the back of my outhouse over here, <laughs> show you what uh, my girls do. <laughs> well, you know, knowing Sansa's age in this scene, it is pretty slimy behavior. Yeah. And it's not like he's outright coming on to her, but he's, he's like planting seeds. You know, he's laying the groundwork for future schemes. He tells Sansa how Sandor Clegane was burned by his brother. But then he also says, if he knew that you knew that story, who knows what might happen? He might hurt you, is what Littlefinger alludes to. But Sansa has a great time at the tourney, right? She loves the pageantry, all the pomp and circumstance of the whole thing. And she thinks that this is what life at King's Landing is like. Yeah, and she, this is great. It's just so much better than the North. Sansa becomes more like a Southerner as time passes. She is rude to Septa Mordain. That's pretty much it until the shit hits the fence, so to speak. Ned resigns as hand to the king because Robert is hellbent on not executing Daenerys Targaryen, but hiring assassins to take out her and the baby that she's rumored to be pregnant with. Ned's not going to stand for that. It's like the only time he's seen Robert at a small council meeting. The only time he's seen Robert worked up about anything involving his office as king of the realm is assassinating Daenerys Targaryen. He's not going to stand for that. He resigns his hand to the king. He's going to send the girls back to Winterfell. She compares Joffrey to a lion. He's nothing like that old drunk king. Right. You've got him all wrong. Yeah, he's worse than the fiend. He's worse than Robert. <laughs> he's worse than Robert, and he's nothing like a lion. But that makes something click in Ned's head. Oh, yeah, he is like a lion. And then he figures it out. All right. Give him the book. Hold on. (laughs) You idiot. (laughs) But then things get bad, and he can't bring this evidence to Robert because Robert's been gored. He's dying. And Ned doesn't want to make his last hours 
I guess he doesn't want to make them upsetting, you know, at the cost of himself and the entire realm. He doesn't want to make Robert's last hours upsetting. Then we get, for me, the big betrayal. Ned makes secret plans for the girls to return to Winterfell. Mm -hmm. He's going to remain and make sure Mm -hmm. Robert finds out the truth, make sure that there's a somewhat smooth transition of power from Robert to Stannis. And he doesn't want the girls around for that because things might get a little hairy. And he's right about that. (laughs) He doesn't realize how hairy things can get. It's not like Ned is telling Sansa, well, you know, he's not really Robert's child. He's a bastard of incest. Mm -hmm. He's not telling that to Sansa. Sansa just thinks her lifestyle that she has fallen in love with, that's going to be taken away because dad's a jerk. He just wants to take all this away from her. So she goes to (laughs) Cersei, who at this time she thinks is a kind and fair queen that loves her. And she gives up the whole plan, everything she knows about it. Has she addressed that in the following, any of the following seasons of Game of Thrones, that the mistakes she made at this point? Yeah, I think she just blames it on that she was a young girl. And that she was, like, being helped by the Lannisters. Which I guess, to a degree, she was. I'm not saying she wasn't. You didn't give her a pass for the direwolf situation. Nope. So you're definitely not giving her a pass here. Nope. Which is worse, do you think? Obviously, this is worse as far as repercussions. But which decision on Sansa's part is worse in terms of betraying your family, siding against your family? The way I look at it, it's both betraying in a way. I mean, almost the same thing a little bit. Ugh. I guess this one's worse because the, the long-term effects, is, is, is it's a lot worse than the direwolf. This one has a lot more long-term. Yeah, even still to this day, it's still, you know, the ramifications are still there. Yeah. In the first case, you could say she lied by saying she doesn't remember. It's not like she sold out her family. He or she's saying, well, my father's going to do this. You have to stop him because I don't want to leave. You know, in the first case, she's just like... She's kind of in a tough spot. She's like, I, I don't remember what happened. You know, I don't want to side against my sister, but I don't want to side against my future husband. Here, she's like, I want to side against my father because I don't like his decision. I'm going to side with my queen, my future good mother in Cersei. And that's a want want. That's a bad decision. But I don't think that Sansa really puts everything together. She doesn't see the connection between what she told Cersei and what happens. She doesn't even make the connection between Ned's arrest and the charge of treason against him and her decision. Right. It's almost as if she doesn't even understand what treason is. Right. And then when she finds out her father's in the dungeons and he's charged with treason, she's like, how is that possible? He wouldn't commit treason. And it shows how immature and how ignorant to where she is and to what it really means to rule at King's Landing and the politics and the backstabbing. She didn't even know those things existed because they don't really exist in the North at Winterfell. Honor, straightforward, that's how Ned rules the North. There's nothing like that in the South. It's a completely different ballgame. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of sad that she can't make that connection. I mean, let's be honest here. <laughs> even Ned kind of makes that <laughs> Even Ned, <laughs> even though Ned knows, he still can't really <laughs> get past it himself. <laughs> It's funny that she doesn't put it together because it's not just that Ned is arrested and charged with treason. It's also (laughs) everybody that she came south with is dead. Is dead. (laughs) You don't think something's up? She's like, this is odd. It's real weird timing. Sansa and Arya don't get, obviously, they don't get a proper send off here. I'm trying to recall what the last scene they have together is. Was it the scene? um, Oh, I know. I'm probably wrong on this. Is this too? They probably had a scene together, but the scene where. uh, they had that argument in the fight, and then Eddard has to calm Arya, oh, it been- calm Arya down. No, I think that was earlier on. I think their last scene together until season seven is when Sansa says he's nothing like that old fat king. He's a lion. And Arya's looking at her like, what are you talking about? He's definitely not a lion. How do you not see what this guy is? They're so unlike each other, Sansa and Arya. I can't think of any qualities they have, behaviors that are similar. I can't think of anything. Sansa lives in this dream world inside her own head. Arya is too young at this point to really see what the world is like, but she has a much firmer grasp on reality than Sansa. Right. She she doesn't have a lot of like life lessons, but like she has a better scope of like what the real life is than what Sansa is. Sansa's in like La La Land. You know, Sansa's in her own little, you know, playland. Mm-hmm. You call her Sansa Tully. But she is more like her mother than like her father. It's obvious. 
I think the Starks have, at least this generation of Starks, the Ned, I, I can't really speak to uh, Brandon Stark, but Ned, Benjen, Liana, it seems like they are much more matter of fact. Their lives are governed more so by logic, reason, than it is whimsy, fantasy, and, and hopes and dreams. It doesn't come across as a, a stark thing at all, but definitely not in that generation. So the disconnect between how stark their outlook on life and their thinking, the disconnect between that and the way Sansa's dreamily going through life, it's all good, everything's going to work out great, I'm going to be queen. It's rather disturbing. Whereas Arya, she's right in the stark wheelhouse. <laughs> they like Sansa right now and just like, you know, like the doink music. <laughs> Welcome to Sansa Land. <laughs> I would associate that music more with Catelyn. Yeah, well, the Benny Hill music also could go with both of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it works for both of them. Addressing what we initially talked about in this episode, how Sansa is, for lack of a better word, the lightning rod. Oh, you don't like Sansa, it's because you don't like women. If this was Bran making these decisions, right? If this was any Stark making these decisions. I it's, hate him. Yes. It's not because Sansa's – she's not even a woman at this point. She's a, a teenage girl. Well, I mean, in Game of Thrones, she's a teenage girl. Sansa's gender at this point has nothing to do with why this is a bad decision and why she should have known better. It's got nothing to do with her being female. But still, somehow, any criticism, any dislike for her character has turned into, well, it's because she's a woman. No. It's not why. Sansa writes the letter to Rob, begging them to swear fealty to Joffrey. She makes no en- no mention of Arya. She's not even worried about Arya. And if we go back to the books, at the end of right, that uh, chapter, yeah, like- she says she didn't even realize that she forgot to ask about her sister. She's not even thinking about Arya at this point. That little girl that came down with you also? <laughs> you know, your sister. <laughs> <laughs> but Sansa comes up with a plan to help her father. At court, she begs Joffrey to show Ned mercy. That's her big plan. And Joffrey agrees to show Ned mercy on the condition that he confesses mm-hmm. his treason. His treason being, he said Joffrey wasn't the real king, and he tried to... Why would your father say have... that? Why would he say that? Yeah, Sansa doesn't even have any idea. Maybe that's Ned's fault. Maybe Ned should have been more honest. Maybe he should have communicated his hunches, what he found out. I don't think Ned understood the depths that she would stoop to. And Ned's treason is not just that Joffrey is not the real king, but also he tried to deliver the Iron Throne to Stannis Baratheon. Joffrey agrees, and we get to the Great Sept of Baelor. Sansa is decked out. She's at the top of the Great Sept of Baelor in front of the huge King's Landing crowd, and she is smiling, and she thinks she's saved her father. She thinks that Joffrey's going to forgive him in front of everybody. She probably thinks they're all going to hug it out. Ned's going to go back north and Sansa's going to have her life of pageantry and tourneys and pretty clothes and all this stuff. It all comes crashing. Oh, man. Does she faint? Is that what she does in the TV show? (laughs) She's she's cannot believe Oh, my God. What have I done? But, But I don't think she's even thinking that at this time. I give that a pass, too, that she doesn't realize that this all connects back to decisions she's made. Yeah, she's no, no, so she shocked. never connects that. Like, it's, it's never, I don't think it's ever, even when she really, even when she comes to that, you know, when she talks to Ari in season seven, it's just like, I was a young girl. Like, dude, you're a young girl who got your father killed pretty much. You're a young girl like, you know, me. What's Joffrey's line? As long as I'm your king, treason shall never go unpunished. Punished. Sir Illyn, bring me his head. And we end season one, Sansa grieving for the death of her father. She finally sees who Joffrey is when Joffrey makes her look upon her father's head and Septimordain's head on spikes. She begs Joffrey to let her return home. Joffrey's like, no, what do you mean return home? It's marriage pact. It's still in place. And then he says he will give her the gift of Rob's head. Sansa says, well, maybe. Give me your head. (laughs) But she gets smacked for that. I don't think Joffrey smacks her, though, right? It- uh, Marin Tran. Yeah, uh, Weasel, King's Guardman. And then, yeah. and then she's about to, like, throw him off the, uh, and then Sandor comes in there and, like, say, it stops her from doing that. It's a real interesting scene and very well acted by Sophie Turner for a young actor. 
she's looking at suicide as a way out. And then she's thinking, pushing him off and going with him. And then Sandor is there. And I think it's probably important to talk about the relationship between Sansa and Sandor. More focus is put on it in the source material to the point where she misremembers a moment in Clash of Kings where Sandor is drunk in, in her uh, apartments, in her room. She misremembers that later on in A Feast for Crows, I believe. She thinks that Sandor kissed her in that scene, and he didn't. But she, for some reason, remembers it as him giving her a kiss before he left. It's interesting that she misremembers that. I could kind of see how she started to finally look at Sandor. You know, she, she was so afraid of him at first because of his burned face, the story that Peter Baelish told her about Sandor, just the gruff demeanor that Sandor had. A book later in A Clash of Kings where Sandor says, I'll, I'll bring it back to Winterfell. He was always there protecting her in a way. When things were going to cross the line to real bad for her, he was there to either stop her behavior or to pick her up in that one scene when Marin Trant beating her at court. He was always looming, always somewhat protective of her. It does feel like the focus is more on a Sandor Arya reunion. And there was nothing with the Sandor Sansa reunion in season seven, was there? No, that would, no, because he went there yeah, now. They, they didn't really go to Winterfell. That that would, that would be this year. Yeah. We'll see Sansa and the Sandor being yeah. reunited. But just when it looks like she's about to push Joffrey off the moat, Sander is there and he wipes some blood from her mouth. He said, what does he say? He says, uh, Excuse, um, just do what he says. It'll be easier. Yeah. Something to that effect. I think that's the last we see of her in season one. So when we pick up season two, she's got that same look in her eye and she's at the tourney for King Joffrey's name day. And it's a good contrast, right? Because we remember the tourney from season one. All the banners, tents, the pageantry, everybody's happy. And now we have, not even a year later, another tourney and it's taking place inside the Red Keep for Joffrey's protection as the War of the Five Kings has broken out. Not in earnest. I don't think all five kings were involved yet. She saved Serdantus Hollard, the drunk knight. She saves him from, Let me ask from you, being killed by Joffrey. Let me ask you, was, was um, Baelish there seeing that? No, he w he was in King's Landing, but he wasn't. Okay. He kept himself away from Dantas Hollard. We find the reveal later that he's working for Littlefinger. During this tournament, Tyrion returns to King's Landing, and he is the acting hand to the king. And Tyrion, he says, that, you know, I'm sorry about your father. I'm sorry about the loss of your father. Uh, and Sansa says her family are all traitors, that she's loyal to Joffrey. Ugh. Tyrion's like, oh, boy. <laughs> what have they done? Yeah, okay. Well, you know, of course you are. <laughs> My sister would be proud. Real tactful by Tyrion here and walking that line where mm -hmm. his family's doing pretty nasty things. Right. But, yeah, go ahead. It's go. probably also kind of like a little rub against Cersei too, you know, and, and, and Joffrey, you know, to make, to make sure like, you know. Oh, you mean a rub against Cersei and Joffrey? Yeah, like, mm -hmm. I feel bad for your yeah. loss, you know, kind of saying there, it shouldn't have happened. He understands the tragedy, even though it's a war or it's politics, or it's something tragic that happened because of the conflict between House Stark, House Lannister. He does understand the tragedy and the human element of it. The next major scene with Sansa Season 2 is, I think this is the, the victory Rob has over, I mean, in the books, it's uh, Sir Stafford Lannister and the second Lannister host that he was raising in Lannisport. Sansa gets publicly beaten for it, humiliated in front of the court. Joffrey tells Sir Marin to I think he tells her to strip her naked. Sandra Clegane is there, and he helps her out. Before I get confused, I think I'm getting confused. Is this me? Might just say, is this the scene where um, Tyrion comes in? Yes. And says, "What are you doing? They have your uncle. Like, if you do anything to her right now, they're gonna, you know, enough of that. They should have killed Jamie already. You know, they, yeah, Jamie should have been killed. Well, that's that's a whole different story, yeah. but yeah. But if they did anything to Sansa and or Arya, the Starks would have to do it. That's now, Tyrion's thinking. Yeah, I mean, from a point of view of war, from a point of view of holding noble hostages, and there are rules to that. It's similar to like, you know, the laws concerning prisoners of war. If somebody surrenders, you're not supposed to kill them. As far as nobility, as far as Westeros, if you're of a noble house, if you're, if you're a noble person and you're in battle and you're caught or you surrender, there's certain rules to how you have to be treated. You have to be protected, basically. And then it becomes, how important are you to your family 
you get treated better. You're a hostage more so than a prisoner. It's not political capital, but it's like capture Jamie Lannister and you capture Tywin Lannister, war's over. Even if the Lannisters outnumber you, it's like a game of chess. You may take both my bishops, you may take my knight and my two rooks. You may have both your rooks, both your bishops, both your knights, but I took a queen, so the game's still kind of even because of the position the queen has, the power that the queen has. And that's the case with Jamie. In terms of political capital and in terms of hostages, Jamie's it's a much more powerful piece to have as hostage than Sansa or even Sansa and Arya together. I would even go so far as to say having Jamie in hand puts Rob in a better position, even if Ned was alive, even Ned, Arya, and Sansa. I'd, I'd say that having Jamie is better than having Ned, Arya, and Sansa. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Because even with Ned um, there. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, because Rob is at Winterfell, and Bran's at Winterfell, Rickon's at Winterfell. There are no Lannister heirs at this point. Joffrey's a Baratheon. It'd be different if Joffrey was a Lannister, and the hostages don't get any more valuable than Jamie. Then he has a conversation with Sansa, removing her from the throne room, and he says if she wants, he can have the engagement called off. And in Sansa's mind, she thinks it's a trap. She doesn't trust any Lannisters, even though Tyrion is a Lannister that can be trusted, at least trusted to be honest. But Sansa says she's loyal to Joffrey. I think Tyrion says something to the effect of she may survive King's Landing after all. And this is a Benioff and Weiss original joint. <laughs> Tyrion. Maybe uh, like a puts, special edition, like, you know, like TV yeah, where yeah. It's like, it's a, I'm telling you, they need like a little like sticker flashing on the corner of the shot. <laughs> just every part of the story that's like D&D original. Tyrion puts Shay in a position as Sansa's handmaiden. Man, I hated this. I hated this. And they make uh, Sansa and Shay form a friendship. Sansa trusts Shay so much that she vents about her hatred of the Lannisters. Not into it. Not into it. I didn't like the character Shay in the books. And I definitely did not like the actress that. Uh, oh, just. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't only the. Oh, yeah. Not the, the actress definitely didn't do anything to restore. Mm-hmm. Very frustrating. I said we have the scene where uh, Marcella Baratheon departs for Dorne for a marriage alliance and a peace alliance between the Lannisters and the Martells that Tyrion worked out. It's so amazing that's back in season two. It was like a different uh, Marcella left than the one that came home. And we have the bread riots as uh, Joffrey and Sansa, Cersei, the whole retinue as they're returning to the Red Keep. The riot breaks out in the streets of King's Landing. Does Sansa get lost in the shuffle, so to speak, in the book? Also, I don't, I don't, honestly, don't remember. I know in this in the story we we see her get chased down. Yeah, she's just yeah, she's just about to. Uh... It's off screen in the books, off page, so to speak. But they show it. They show the action in Game of Thrones, and again, it's Sandor turning out to be not what Sansa initially thought. Not a monster. Not a scary man. But protector. Yeah. Sander saves her, and then uh, I think, yeah, and then Sansa has her period. Trying to hide that so, like she tries to burn her. She tries to burn her sheets. <laughs> so, like that right there, though, does show her. They it does show us though that you know, she knows now. Maybe at this point, at least she's starting to. Know, they find this out, then they're going to you know want a baby, and I don't want to have a baby. Finally, now she's realized I don't want to want to have a baby with this guy. She has to do a lot of growing up here. It's safe to say what she thought. Of the world, what she thought of King's Landing, what she thought of Joffrey, you know, this whole situation. She's done a 180 uh, at this point. Joffrey had said something to the effect of, You have your flowering, I'll put a sun in you. That's like so, oh, it's just so like. He's such a prick. But she keeps that in the back of her mind. When she finally wakes up with blood on her bed, she realizes what's happening. She can be married, have a child. Of course, they write Shay into this scene here. Shay tries to help her burn the sheets. She tries to help her conceal the bloodstains, and uh, Shay threatens to kill another handmaiden if she tells anybody that Sansa had her period, which the handmaiden does anyway. Or no, no, Sander. I think Sander sees the blood. I don't know. I, I, no, I thought I, I think you're right the first time. I think uh, it was the handsman. I don't think Sander would rat would rat because he he yeah because he knew yeah like he knew if shit you know. Sansa and Cersei have a, it's probably the most genuine conversation we see from Cersei throughout the whole series, I think, is the conversation she has with Sansa about being a woman. She basically tells Sansa that she understands why she's scared of her flowering. She understands that she may not love Joffrey, but she will love 
her children. She warned Sansa, the more people she loves, the weaker she will be. Blackwater episode, Joffrey makes Sansa kiss the blade of his sword. <laughs> I'll find that. After I slice status, I'll come back for your traitor brother. <laughs> I would yeah. love to see him in a one-on-one fight against Stannis. Oh, God, that would oh, be great. God, yeah. Joffrey's such a tyrant and a, and a monster with such a heavy bearing on Sansa's life. But in all of his enemies outside of King's Land, he's a joke. He's an afterthought. Everybody knows they're fighting Tywin. Yeah. So, in the TV show, Sansa is in Mager's Holdfast with Cersei and all the noble women and... uh when the battle looks like it's taking a turn for the worse, Four House Lannister, Cersei, takes off, and it's up to Sansa to calm the woman down by singing a, uh, a hymn, <laughs> or whatever she does. And then she- go- Yeah. I, I can't say. I'll no, but the, yeah, you, you get the melody, right? All the noble women are, are immediately all calmed down. But Sansa goes to her own apartments, and uh, she finds Sandra Clegane there. Who <laughs> always pop it up? Yeah. Well, this is the last time because yeah. he was. Uh, Man, already he runs off. Offers Sansa to go with him, and he'll bring her to Winterfell. I don't know. I feel like she should have taken that offer. It goes to show how much more growth Sansa still has to do. Not taking this offer from Sander, but then taking the offer from Sir Dantas a couple seasons later. A different set of circumstances, but and we end season two. Their marriage is called off. The whole time, Javri, from afar, has fallen in love with Lady Marjorie Terrell, <laughs> and vice versa. And she thinks she's out. She thinks she's out, and then Little Fair comes back in there. He'll never be out of his clutches. Yeah, she probably thinks she's out to the point of she thinks she's going to go back to Winterfell. Like it's all yeah. good. Oh, God, what an ass! What an ass clown! Just, just like we, just like we think, like you know. She's getting some sand. She's starting to see, you know, the sun through the clouds. Like, all of a sudden, she just gets, goes back into this, you know, fantasy world. Yeah. And Peter comes in and he knocks that down. Uh, season three. Kind of a weird season for Sansa. Not a whole lot for her to do at all in season three. Her escape from King's Landing is until season four. Joffrey doesn't really pick on her as much in season three. Littlefinger offers to, again, to smuggle her out of King's Landing, and but she's reluctant. She meets the Tyrells. She becomes close enough with Marjorie to tell her, please don't marry Joffrey. You know, he's a monster. Or, he, no, she tells that to uh, Alina, Alina Tyrell, right? Yeah. And this is where they have all the uh, Tyrells want her to marry Loris. Loris and then... Time we get to hold out. No, 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 no. She's going to be marrying Tyrion. Yeah. Yeah. It is kind of interesting to see the larger politics in the show. We see a scene with Tywin and Alina. Yeah, Sansa tells Alina, Tyrell, and Marjorie that Joffrey's a monster. She was so scared to say this to them. Right. And they're like so unfazed by it. They're like, all right, well, you know, we'll handle it. I think Sansa kind of looks up to that, no? I'm trying to. I'm trying to think back to her uh, reaction. I think Sansa becomes more like Marjorie as her story progresses. You know, Cersei, Marjorie, Littlefinger. Unfortunately, more so than her own mother and father, their big influences on her life and the noble lady that she becomes. You think she's kind of learning that this is stuff that she, how she should have been stronger. Right. Yeah. You know, like, against like, Joffrey House, you know. But but it's also weird, though, too, is that, uh, what's her name, Marjorie, you know, mm-hmm. is doing all this stuff for the uh, for the poor. And, and it seems like Joffrey, is, he's more of a fake around her than, than he was around Sansa. That's a good point. That's interesting. And it's true. But, what, like, why do you think that is? Like, why do you think he he never- I don't know. He never mistreats Marjorie. It's got nothing to do with the alliance between Lannister and Tyrell. Tywin, Cersei, Tyrion, not that they're walking on eggshells around the Tyrells, but they need that alliance. They need House Tyrell's wealth or maybe, and House they, Tyrell's Maybe it is military. because of the alliance. Maybe maybe Cersei said, listen, you have to play the game here because we, we really, you know, it wasn't for them, we'd all be dead. She probably said something along those lines, and that may be part of it, but like I feel there was a change in Joffrey's character 
he's different around Marjorie. Marjorie's a lot different than Sansa. Sansa came across as somebody that Joffrey could pick on, whereas Marjorie, she's she's more of a woman. Where Sansa was a little girl, and I think that's intimidating to Joffrey. Do you think he's like in awe of Marjorie? Like, do you think he's uh, possibly? Do you think he finds her more attractive than Sansa? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Plus, I think it's the age he's at. He's less in adolescence and more into being a young man who may be thinking about his wedding night more so than he was with Sansa. But the way Marjorie carries herself, she knows what's going on. And that comes across where Sansa, this chick's she's got no idea what's going on. Marjorie acts as like she just got the idea that Sansa should marry Loras. And then she'll be allowed to leave King's Landing. And Sansa's like, hell yeah. I'll go live in the nice weather of yeah. uh, the Reach. The Reach of High Garden, yeah. And I'm sure she's immediately picturing that. All this growth she had, she immediately goes back to that bright-eyed, bushy-tailed young girl that came to King's Landing. She totally reverts. It's like the past year or however long it was. It's like that didn't happen. Now, it comes crashing down real quick when Tywin learns about this plan that the Trolls have. That's interesting, too, that Sansa doesn't see the political motivation of the Trolls. She's not a pawn, but she's, you know, she, she's a, a piece of the game. She's not playing the Game of Thrones, right? She's mm-hmm. a piece. She doesn't see how she is a road for any of these families to take control of the North, to take control of Winterfell. She just doesn't see it. She thinks it's a marriage because Loras kind of likes her. Because Loras, Loras is really in love with her. So he wants to marry. He's got nothing to, nothing to do with that. Doesn't matter because she doesn't marry Loras. Tywin swoops in. Swoops in the intercept. Marries like off to Tyrion. Uh, like an eel coming down from the uh, sky. Like a lion pouncing yeah, on its he, when prey. When he sees blood, forget about it. So we probably get the, uh, maybe not the happiest wedding <laughs> in Game of Thrones, but definitely the uh, safest and uh, least eventful. I hate to change the subject. Uh, did you see, I don't know who put the tweet out, but they said, uh, according to the Dothrakis, the red wedding is a, was a, uh, was a great affair. <laughs> <laughs> Joffrey is an asshole at their pretty much a shotgun wedding. Uh, you know, there's enough nobility there to witness the wedding, which is really the important part of these things for the great lords is that people witness the wedding and people witness the betting so people can say, yeah, they're married. That doesn't go through with it. I mean, they go to the bed, you know, they go to the room, but he doesn't allow the undressing. He doesn't allow that. He just grabs Sansa by the hand and goes to their chambers. He knows he has to consummate the marriage. But he also still sees Sansa as a child, and he knows that Sansa fears him. Not fears him like she fears Joffrey, but for much of Sansa's life, all the Lannisters were the same. Tyrion realizes how unhappy she is, and she doesn't have to consummate the marriage unless she wants to. Which Sansa says, uh, what if I never want to? Think of the book Tyrion says, that's what whores are for. But he says it to himself. Here he says, and so my watch begins. Which is mm-hmm. a joke about the Night's Watch and how they take oaths to... Uh, right. You know, not have sex. More so in the show, Sansa and Tyrion have a decent friendship, I guess. And he treats her well. Things are okay for her. You know, Joffrey can't pick on her as much. Tyrion takes care of her. But then she finds out about the Red Wedding. And I think that's how we leave her in season three. That was a powerful, that was, that was a passionate, powerful scene because you know, Tyrion, Tyrion goes in to tell her. And by the time, you know, he gets there, she already knows he can see, you know, he can see the tears. Yeah, I'm giving, I'm, Giving credit to a Sansa scene. Less because of Sansa, I think it's more because of the writer and the director of that episode. You don't need to see Sansa receive the news because you can already imagine what her reaction will be. So they give it by Tyrion's point of view. They have him learn about it. Joffrey's celebrating the victory. They're all celebrating that Rob's been defeated. Tyrion's not so happy about it. And it's not that he's upset that they beat House Stark or that Rob's dead. It's just the way they went about it. He's not good with that. Plus, he knows how it will affect Sansa. He doesn't really care about Sansa. That's another reunion I'm really looking forward to is Sansa and, and, and Tyrion. And that should be episode one, right? Um, you would imagine, unless, unless they just drag out John and Danny coming to uh, Woodfell for an episode somehow. But I don't know how well they, how, you know, I don't think they'll do that. Hopefully they'll just get it yeah. over with. Get on the business. Season four. Sophie Turner has... Uh, I think she does a lot of growing up in between season three, season four. The actress, I mean. But Sansa in character is still distraught over the death of Rob and Catelyn. Now she gets approached by Sir Dantas. 
Then this is the first time we see him since that episode, right? Yeah. When we didn't see him after episode one of season two, I think the rumor was <laughs> it would be Roz that takes his place and gets her out of King's Lady. But he comes back here. He gives her a necklace and he says that it was his mother's. The necklace turns out to hold poison. All part of the plan. Mm -hmm. Still a pawn, Sansa. Episode two is mm -hmm. the purple wedding, right? Season four. Take it, man. What did you think of book to screen with the purple wedding? <sighs> I mean, I, I enjoyed it. I just always assumed, just envisioned that the wedding was more of an inside event and not outside. I don't know if I was wrong mm -hmm. on that. Maybe in a way I read it could have easily been wrong. No, I took that the same I way also. You know. Yeah. But Joffrey dies pretty much the same way he did in the books. Except for Sansa, there's no plan in place where the night of the wedding, I'll help you escape from King's Landing, instead runs up on her as Joffrey's dying and says, It's now or never. Doesn't he say something like, they're going to think you did it, you have to come with me? I think it's something to that degree. It's pretty tight from Littlefinger's point of view. It, it does work, but you know, how is she going to say no to that? You know, of course, Cersei's going to think that. And Sansa thinks she's escaping, but she's still a piece to the bigger game. Except now Littlefinger has her in hand. Speaking to Littlefinger, maybe this is his big play in A Song of Ice and Fire. But it's somewhat disappointing to the Littlefinger character. It's definitely a good play. But that was the extent of his plan. Get some power. Lord of Harrenhal. And he was also Warden of the Riverlands. Harrenhal. Also with the title of Lord of Harrenhal, which he was given as a reward for his service during the War of the Five Kings. Basically, he got Hoster Tully's titles. Lord Paramount of the Riverlands. But that title then gives him the position to marry Lysa Aaron, the widow, and the uh, Lady of the Vale. Sir Dantas brings Sansa to the boat, and we get to reveal that it's Littlefinger that's helping her escape. Obviously, they, they kill Sir Dantas. Does he tell her that Joffrey was poisoned by her necklace? Yes, because he smashes it. Right. They don't dye her hair yet. They enter the Vale, and Sansa is his niece, Lane Stone. But she doesn't have her hair dyed yet. But they go to the Eyrie, they go to, to see her Aunt Lysa. Lysa lets Sansa know that she's in on it. She knows that Sansa is her niece. We get crazy Lysa pretty quick, right? It's always been crazy. <laughs> yeah. I think Sansa at first is happy to see her aunt and feels safe. All of a sudden, she's like, uh-oh, my aunt is crazy. But she does see Peter Baelish kiss Sansa. Yeah. But something happens before that that where Sansa's like, oh, she's, you know, she's, she's off her... She's off her meds. She's crazy. Doesn't she like hit Robin Aaron? Is that when Robin Aaron jumps in the, on the uh, snow uh, land of Winterfell? The snow castle she built of Winterfell. Yeah. He that's right. freaks out. Yeah. There's another guy that's going to live to the end. <laughs> yeah, Sansa hits him. Littlefinger shows up. He says that he was in love with Catelyn. Yeah. And then he kisses her? Or does he say he's in love nah, with her? He I says, forget I, what he says exactly. But. I mean, I always loved this system more than you. <laughs> right. Because Lysa sees. Littlefinger kiss mm -hmm. Sansa. Lysa summons her to the throne room to threaten her. Sansa's like, I didn't kiss him. Like, he kissed me. What do you, you know, what do you want me to do? Littlefinger tells the Lords of the Vale that she committed suicide. Sansa's called to give testimony. And here she reveals who she really is. And she supports Peter Baelish's story. That's good enough for the Lords of the Vale. Ned Stark's daughter. If she says Littlefinger's all right, then he's all right. I think that's it for season yeah, four of Sansa, Yeah, because then I believe. pretty much we go to Baelish uh, going off to the north with her two. Uh... Yeah. Eesh. And it doesn't feel it doesn't feel organic. Littlefinger makes a marriage alliance between Sansa and Ramsay Bolton, who is now, he's legitimized and the heir to the north. After the death of Robb Stark, Roose becomes warden of the north. Ramsay is his heir. And Sansa is reluctant to marry Ramsay. Obviously. You want me to marry someone that killed my brother? Yeah. But Littlefinger says the marriage will give her the opportunity to avenge her family. Eh, I don't know if I buy all that. But they see Brienne of Tarth on the way to Winterfell. And she's like, oh, uh, I swore to your mom I'd take care of you. You should come with me. And Sansa's like, well, like, what are we going to do? <laughs> Where are we going to go? <laughs> I think, you know, Sansa is finally starting to mature. At this point, and she realizes there is no escape from this life. She's a noble lady, no matter what. And maybe that's what Benioff and Weiss were trying to get across with her marriage to Ramsay. But it just it just feels like a way for them to condense a lot of storylines. Uh, Brienne follows her 
to Winterfell and does she tell her that she'll always be looking? No, no, it's it's Sansa's handmaiden at Winterfell, right? That Bran works out the plan with the candles or whatever. No, no, it wasn't that. No, no, it wasn't Sansa's handmaid. It was just some. Wasn't it just some late old lady? Yeah, they should have made it old man. Oh, she sees that the young Greyjoy is basically Ramsay's slave. That's like she just yelling at him, like you know, you murdered Bran and Rickon, your brothers, and then Theon gives it up. No, it wasn't Bran Rickon. Uh, I forget when she confronts him. Or maybe she doesn't confront them till after she's yeah, married. Yeah, yeah, that, that is true. I, I'm, I'm skipping a while. It's got the timeline. Well, it's because it's all it's all like a cluster. Like they're trying to get, and honestly, they do a better job of it than George R. R. Martin. But getting all the pieces where they need to be to move the story forward. So it is a bit of a cluster. But I did like the wedding aesthetically. I like the way the wedding looked in front of the Godswood. I wonder who directed that episode, but I, it looked real good. But then Ramsay rapes Sansa and forces Theon to watch. And as we find out later on, Bran's actually watching also. <laughs> <laughs> Ramsay continues to rape and beat Sansa every night. Keeps her locked in the bedchamber. Sansa begs Theon to help her signal her northern allies. So I guess she did know about the candle in the broken tower. And then I didn't get this. Theon tells Ramsay about the tower candle. The maid that was helping Sansa communicate with Brienne is flayed. And Ramsay Sansa makes watch. Sansa look at her corpse, which is a throwback to Joffrey making Sansa look. Then Sansa confronts Theon. Theon admits that he didn't capture Brandon Rickon. He killed two farm boys in their place. At the same time, Stannis has launched the worst war campaign <laughs> ever. <laughs> Directly marching on uh, Winterfell. Sansa is able to signal Brienne. And of course, Brienne has left her post because she heard Stannis is here. Brienne choosing her oath as a member of the Rainbow Guard before the oath she made to Catelyn. Is basically what's going on with Brienne here, right? Mm -hmm. it's, definitely, it's definitely a throwback. Yeah. That was the first oath she made as a member of the Rainbow Guard. She made that long before she made an oath to Catelyn. What was Ram Ramsay's girlfriend's name? The oh, uh, something with an M? Yeah. I feel like she's named after a character from the books, but it's not the same character. Whoever it is, she catches Sansa not in her room. She shouldn't threaten to kill Sansa. It's not, it's not Madeline. No. No. It's the way it ends, I think. But Theon, uh, Miranda. Yeah. Bit, here it is, Miranda. Theon throws Miranda to her death just as the Bolton forces return from their mop up victory over Stannis. Theon is scared of Ramsay's reaction, so he and Sansa jump from Winterfell's battlements into the snow. And that's it for season five. This nowhere met the excitement and the fear of Theon's escape from Winterfell in A Dance with Dragons. That was some scary stuff. What did you think of the whole Sansa marries Ramsay storyline? Obviously another shortcut, definitely. It's a big time Benioff and Weiss original joint here. It's uh, rewriting George Martin's material. And in the big scheme of things, it makes sense, right? The thing that gets a little upsetting about it is, you know, in the books, there's been plenty of times for Jon Snow to have gone down south to have uh, forsaken mm -hmm. his vows to the Night Watch father, Eddard was caught. He wanted to go down and fight with, with Rob. When Rob got killed, there was plenty of times. And the show with doing with Sansa, it just it ruins it kind of a little bit. Because there's just... See, in the show, Sansa comes there's up no north first. I'm skipping ahead. There's no letter or the equivalent in the show, is there? No, there is. There is. That's the letter that John reads. Okay. That's their, that's their equivalent to the pink letter. That's in season six. What I'm trying to say is in the books, when he gets the pink letter... Yeah, we can argue that Ramsay has made a, or the author has threatened John because he's going to come up north. They have Mance Raider, they have Stannis, they have this, that, and that. But the long skinny of it is the reason why John goes down there, really, deep down, is because he thinks they have Arya. Right. And John would save Arya. Honor brought him back with Ned. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't go down south to revenge Rob. There's only one person that John will do it for, and that is Arya. And it just kind of it ruins it a little bit by not having the fake Arya character because would John really do that for Sansa? Benioff and Weiss do cover themselves by timing. They put the timing, yeah. They put John's death first. Right, so he's free of his vows. Right. That is an interesting point. When Ned is captured, he races off to help his brother Rob. Honor brings him back. It's like a knee-jerk reaction. Mm-hmm. 
then when Rob is killed, he's missed that because he was beyond the wall. But when he finds out, he knows his place is at the wall. There's nothing he can do about that. He's not going to take any more vengeance. He's not going to go down south mm-hmm. and take vengeance. Because he knows he can at this point. And he knows that there's a bigger fight at the wall. And then Stannis offering him Winterfell, offering to legitimize mm-hmm. him, make him John Stark. All right, you couldn't avenge your family, but you can carry on your family at Winterfell and make sure nothing bad happens to your family again. Because you will be John Stark, Warden of the North. And he's real tempted at that, but he turns that down as well. When he gets that pink letter and really figures out, sees who Ramsay is, that Arya may be in danger. There's no question. Not even is there no question. He actually, he enlists the Wildings to help him. He knows he's betraying his vows, you know, all premeditated. And he's about to go march on Winterfell when he's betrayed in the books. It seems like they don't even go there, though, in the show. They time it so, I don't even know if he knew that Sansa was married to Ramsay. They would say the wall is the last place for news to reach. I'm trying to think back if he got, if he got word of it. I don't remember him mentioning anything about it. He was busy with the hard home and, you know, the whole Night's King thing. So, but he is, you know, he's murdered and brought back before he has to make any decision about whether or not to save mm-hmm. Sansa. Benny and Weiss do, I think, for the most part, cover themselves there. But we get our first big reunion in season six when Sansa does arrive at Castle Black. Sansa doesn't say we're going to go to Castle Black. Theon lets go and Theon's like, oh, I'm going to go return to the Iron Islands. I don't think Theon doesn't go with her out of fear for no, John. Yeah, Theon says, yeah, yeah, Theon says yeah, I can't go up north there because John's there and John will kill me, you know, if I go up north. Right. And then we see Sansa and John, as you said, the first, the first Stark reunion. Mm-hmm. Least important. Well, it ends up being, yeah. it ends up being pretty important, but. Yeah, it seems pretty emotional. A lot more emotional than I thought it would be. Well, because it was the first one. That's why. Yeah. You know. Sansa persuades John to help her drive the Boltons out of Winterfell. John refuses, but then he gets the letter. He still refuses, and she still has to, you know, coerce him into doing it. Well, yeah, Ramsay says uh, he has Rick and Stark, and he threatens to kill the Starks and the Wildings. John is let through the wall if Sansa is not returned to him. He doesn't tell Sansa that he died and came back to life, right? I don't think so, no. Dude, they gloss over that so much. John and Sansa spend a lot of time in season six rallying houses to their cause. The only real help they get is House Mormon, baby. <laughs> One and only. Uh-huh. Everybody loved Liana Mormon so much, and she had such little screen time in season seven, and I can't see her having a whole lot in season eight. I guess it speaks to how good that actress was in the role. So they have like 50 guys from House Mormon. 60, 62. 62. This is really part we start seeing John and Sansa arguing with each other. You know, they... You know, John knows it's not enough men. Sansa, you know, making deals behind John's back. Yeah. All the things that Sansa did in season one, if I was able to give that a pass because of her age, this is the stuff that I really have a problem with Sansa doing. I understand the plot. I understand the war strategy. Mm -hmm. But it's almost as she doesn't care if John dies. It is like that because it's either she doesn't trust him with the information. If she tells John the strategy that he has the veil, John's not going to attack. But he's going to wait for the veil, right? He's going to wait for the veil. Mm-hmm. And I think Sansa knew that the only way to win this was to get the Bolton army away from Winterfell, out of Winterfell. Mm-hmm. By them thinking they have an easy victory. Right. And So in that regard, it's almost that she doesn't care about John dying. John can easily die in that battle. Right. That's the issue with it. It's not that warfare is unacceptable or that kind of play is unacceptable. Like, you have to do what you have to do to win a battle. But the fact that she was willing to sacrifice John. Maybe I'm taking it the wrong way, but she knew Rickon was a lost cause. She knew that Ramsay was going to kill Rickon no matter what. Mm-hmm. So she wrote him off, whereas John was like, well, we have to try and save him. Or Ben F. Weiss saying that Sansa is now finally a player in the Game of Thrones? Maybe Sansa's right in this whole thing. But I, I just don't like that she gave up on Rickon and she was willing to sacrifice John to be the Lady of Winterfell. It's like a pretty Catelyn Tully mm-hmm. move. Difference being, Catelyn Tully's not capable of a successful move like that. Uh, Sansa also sends Bran to the Riverlands to, to convince the Blackfish to aid the Starks. Like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, I'm under siege, but I'll, you know, I'll definitely, I'll definitely leave the castle and help you win Winterfell back. No problem. <laughs> but they do have a scene right after they win Winterfell, and Sansa says she's sorry for not telling John. Mm-hmm. John forgives her. And then, yeah, she said, uh, a white raven came. Because well, that's just his character. But it's also I feel like it'll come to play when John shows up with Daenerys. Yeah, but she won't she won't forgive him though. Mm-hmm. Someone made a, a comment 
maybe I'll go to a Johnny point real, real quick. I just want to make mention of it. Basically said that whoever this one is, is far too gentle, where, whereas Daenerys and John are always out for revenge and killing people. You might say that about Daenerys, but like... Well, who's, like who's, dude, who said this? Some guy on YouTube. And I'm like, what about John? John's like freed so many people. John has to reluctantly kill people, yeah, but doesn't want to do it. You can say Daenerys maybe, yes, fire and blood. Yeah. That's a dumb thing for that person that's, to say. That's like not that's, John at all. That's not John at all. John, if anything, is actually too kind hearted, maybe. He's too much like his he's too much like Edward. Does John still think Theon killed Brandon Ricken? I don't think so. I imagine Sansa had to have told him. Well, that's that's why that's part of the reason I ask. John lets him John lets him go and John actually says if it wasn't for Sansa, you'd be dead. Right. See, I think if that's if that's Daenerys, I think, you know, she Daenerys kills him. Yeah. yeah. By that time he sees, I think by that time, now he knows that Bran's alive, because by that time he's getting letters from Bran, by the time he sees Theon in season seven. So, you know, he knows. It's, it's a new point. He knows. Yeah. And he lets Theon go anyway, so it's not. But Theon still betrayed Rob. He still took Winterfell. He still messed up a lot of things for House Stark. It'd be understandable if he killed him, but he doesn't. He shows restraint. And that's the only example I can think of, of John having any thoughts on revenge, you know, you know, even, uh, um, I mean, yeah, yeah. He kills, he, he, he wants to kill Ramsey, but he doesn't, he could have, but he doesn't, he wanted Ramsey to face justice. That's a stupid thing for that guy to say. It's, that's totally, totally inaccurate. And there's nothing gentle about Sansa in season six, season seven. She's like, I guess she's a player now. She's like a, a, a Northern version of Cersei at this point. And this one real before you go on season seven, they had that key of, um, King, new King of the North. Key scene with Baelish and Sansa talking about who do you think this, who do you think the North's going to follow? The true blood daughter of, uh, Ned and Callan Stark or a bastard son of a motherless child born in the South? Well, option B is what they choose. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, let's, let's talk about that real quick. Like, because, I, I mean, season seven, what, what does Sansa do? You know, her reunion with Arya. And, mm-hmm. but most of her season, most of season seven for Sansa is about. Argue with Arya and had said the, the possible tension that you, that one that was going to betray one or the other. Right. Which is all a ruse for Littlefinger. So, mm-hmm. I mean, there's not much to say about season seven. Um, you know, I think the big stuff for Sansa is here in these episodes. You know, Littlefinger reveals his plan to her. He wants to marry her and rule. Westeros, and she's like, she well, denies and the, him. And then another key scene, another you know key scene we see John. So again, this is John doesn't kill Ned Umber and Alice Carstark. Was that you know where they had? Was that season six or season seven? That's seven. Yeah, that's like the first so, episode, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't think Sansa wanted to kill him either, but she wanted to give those castles. Yeah, yeah right. She didn't want to kill him, but you, you know, wanted to give those castles to people who were loyal to House Stark. That's such an awesome scene. Yeah. And love that scene. And that's that's the I mean, that's a good summary of why the Vale and Northerners declared John their king. Right? Because Sansa's way of thinking, understandably so, is a southern way of thinking. Right. But then like one episode later, they're like, We should have had you the queen. You know, it's like that just be, I don't know. I, I've always had a problem with that. Like, one episode later, you know, Glover's out there. Lady Stark, we should have named you the queen instead of the, <laughs> instead of naming John King. Yeah. I mean, you understand why you kind of understand, kind of understand why they're mad, but, um, yeah, that, sh- that, that, that line sh- honestly should have been, been given to, uh, one of the Lords of the Vale, right? Cause. Yeah. But whatever. Yeah. It, it is, it is what it is. Uh, Yo, but for the scene where they declared John their king, um, why do you think? I mean, he they they look at him as the person that won the battle of the bastards, right? Uh, Sansa, you could say Sansa won it with her her pol- politicking to get the the Knights of the Vale involved. I mean, that was the winning stroke. But for Northerners, they look it's at the John, battle. Yeah. It's John on the front line. Yeah. It's John being the guy, right? And that's the difference between. People of the North and people of the South. The South is like, you know, grandstanding. Um, 
you know, it's a, a, a appearances in the South. The North, it's like good old hard work. And, uh, I don't think Sansa expected to be named Queen of the North. Like, I don't think she thought that they would say Queen of the North. But I think she thought they would recognize. Some more credit. Yeah. Like, I, she thought they would recognize that she won the battle. You know, she won back Winterfell. And, uh, she did in many ways, but she wouldn't have without John. And I, maybe she thought all the credit should go to her because she was kind of treating John as a piece in the game, but it was the two of them together that won Winterfell. You know, I'm sure that theme will play into season eight, the Starks as a whole. And it did in season seven. They tricked Littlefinger, who was trying to divide them all, and, and they ended up together. Starks are stronger than apart, I guess. I think that will play more so into, into season eight. But that look when John's declared king between Sansa and Peter Baelish, you thought there would be more to it, right? In a way, Baelish didn't have enough time to maybe get his claws. I and mean, he definitely tried to keep on spewing his garbage to have Sansa and John not, you know. There's that, there was that one scene in uh, episode season seven, or was that, it must have been episode one or two, where they're talking in, the, in front of the courtyard. Mm-hmm. I don't know. When I look at season seven now, it, it just seems like the whole thing was a work. And I guess it's when Arya shows up that they put together the timeline in King's Landing that led to Ned's beheading. Bran obviously knows everything. It must have been, I guess when they had that scene in, in front of the heart tree, right? Mm-hmm. They must have put it together there. But there's also, there's also, I believe, I think I mentioned before, this deleted scene that they never showed. Yeah, you did say this. Which makes no sense why they wouldn't show it. But what, what, maybe, what, maybe the too obvious then. It was a Bran scene? I think a Bran and Sansa scene. Okay. A Bran's like, Sansa, don't kill Arya. I seen it all. Yeah, I feel like the whole storyline was a little bit padded. If we knew the Starks were in, in it. Cahoots. Yeah, which, I mean, they're family. Why wouldn't they be? But if they didn't didn't use, like, editing tricks, which they, Benny and Fomais did, to make the viewer think that there was actually discord, there was animosity and mistrust between Sansa and Arya. It doesn't work for me because it, it's like making us think the Starks are something they're not for the sole reason of a payoff of uh, a one scene payoff in which Littlefinger is finally beat at his own game. It didn't feel organic. The payoff was real good. i give you that. Uh, what do you think? You think it was a little too much on that whole Sansa versus Arya well, thing? Well, I just don't think this bounce off what you're kind of saying a little bit. It's just I don't think you can really just possibly see that Arya or Sansa are going to die season seven by by each other's hands, you know? Yeah. You only have so much time with these characters and you omit some characters because of logistics, because of time. You omit some characters to so not to confuse the audience any further because it's it's such a, a complicated story you're telling. But sometimes they do these things which are unnecessary to the story and kind of violate what they're emitting other characters for. It's like we talked about uh, in, in the Brian episode with uh, Locke and the mutineers. The you know, mutineers. Ugh. Sir Jory, your father was killed by mutineers. I know. Just when you thought they were going like, to stop using that word, they had to do it. They had to, they had to bring it back for uh, season seven. The, <laughs> we killed every mutineer. Like, oh, God. It's not with that damn word. Uh, they they got to use it in season eight now. I gotta, yeah, they, they just have to remember what the mutiny is. <laughs> but that whole that whole episode to me, uh, and I think I said it, it felt like a side quest. John's not going to die there, Craster's Keep, and he's not going to reach Bran. Like you know that going into the episode, so the whole thing was just like a, like a waste that didn't really move the story forward. It just it, it kept it in a, in a flight pattern for an episode, and you're going to run into situations like that with such a sprawling narrative, but Sansa vs. Arya felt like that times times 10 because of how many episodes the storyline took with it. And it just felt like a waste. That's basically Sansa's story thus far. And before we end, I want to go back to the beginning with Sansa being that, at least in the fandom, that character that some fans can say, well, you don't like her because she's a woman. I don't like Sansa, mostly because of her decision-making in the Battle of the Bastards. You hate Sansa, and it goes all the way back to things she did as a child. What things 
make you most angry about her. Oh, and, gosh. And there's a follow-up part. Can you name anything about her character that you either like or any positive takeaways from Sansa? I'm trying to think of like a re- I'm trying to think of a of a scene, uh something I can't I I'm just I'm at a I'm at a, I'm at a loss. <laughs> Nothing redeemable about her at all. I just can't think of anything. <laughs> and I'm sure there yeah. is. I mean I'm I'm sure I'm, I'm missing a scene or something, but All right, so how about this? You know, if if somebody says to you, You don't like Sansa because she's because she's a girl. You don't like Sansa. How would you respond to that? I first tell them that there's plenty of female characters that I love in this in, in this story. Some that in the show. Mm-hmm. Secondly, most I think that are not in the show, right? Yeah, <laughs> Ariane Martell, notwithstanding, yeah. definitely, yeah. definitely withstanding. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason why I don't like her is not because she's female. It's, she's not a, a good person. She betrays her family. She lies. Will do anything to keep her dreams alive. That you know, that the cost of her family. She treats. She's just like her mother. How she just takes out how she treats John. Like John's a, a second-rate citizen. Does he think to give the, the her own father the benefit of the doubt on that? Mm. The list can just go on and on of like all little yeah. things. But all, all those things that you don't like about her, if she was. And and you don't like Bran Tully, Rob Tully. You know, both of them have have soured in your mind for lesser offenses. But if it was Bran and Sansa, like if Sansa had been crippled and became the Three Eyed Raven, and Bran was in Sansa's place somehow, you'd hate Bran, right? I hate that argument, especially when it comes to fiction, and not even fiction like like a real world drama. Fiction like set in uh, you know with dragons Dude, and magic. Dragons and, and- <laughs> Like, what, what, why are you reading Shadow so deep babies. into this and, and making this about, like, society now? Yeah. My like or dislike of a character doesn't have anything, for a woman at least, it's got nothing to do with them taking regency or control of their own life. It, uh, what else you got, John? Anything Anything uh, you want to say about Sansa? Mm, not really. Has there ever been a time where you thought you might dislike Sansa more than you dislike Catelyn. Uh, I think about it sometimes, but uh, she's not as bad as Catelyn. She's a little smarter than Catelyn. Catelyn was just complete. Uh, like, Sansa made some decent smart maneuvers, as you can say, whether you agree mm. with them or not agree with them, but anything that Catelyn did just really turned into shit. You know, Catelyn should have better prepared Sansa when she initially went to King's Landing. Yeah, you know, I talked about Ned should have communicated what he was thinking in terms of the princes and the princess, how they were not Robert's kids. Maybe he should have told Sansa that. Maybe that would have helped her to see what was really going on. But Catelyn did not do a good job preparing her daughter for what she was walking into at King's Landing. And Catelyn kind of knows what it's like in the South because she was raised in River Run. And it's just fun to blame everything on Catelyn. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening. Appreciate it. You can find us and like us, facebook.com slash The Promise Princes. Follow us on Twitter at Princes Promise. Read the Westerosi Companion, the Princes That Were Promised.com, Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube. Find the Princes That Were Promised. Subscribe to us. Leave a review. We will speak to you guys next time. Bum, 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 b